Welcome to Documentary First, an inside look at a first time filmmaker's journey. I am your host, Josh Lindsay from the Movie Proposal Podcast. And with us is our first time award winning filmmaker, Christian Taylor. Hi, Josh. How are you? I'm great. Uh, you've earned another award. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Congratulations. Thank you. But also with us, as always, couldn't do it without him, the amazing, the one and the only, Jason Rugg. Hey there. Woo! Is it possible to win too many awards, Christian? No. Definitely. <laughs> I think you're on the road to that. I don't know. I feel so <laughs> pessimistic. Like, we haven't been accepted into any other festivals after Red Rock, which is um, starts November 4th, which is feels weird. Um because our festival season will keep going through next June. And I'm sure we'll get into one or two more. Um, I actually went down the Academy Award qualifying film festival list um, yesterday. And there are about 10 that I still have to apply to that I forgot hadn't opened up yet. So I'll be doing that next week. So for that, would that be an Academy Award for 2020 or 2021? Great question. Um, so I, so all of these Academy Award qualifying ones that I did not apply to yet, the film festivals take place in 2021. So we would qualify for the year 2021, which would air usually in January of 2022. Okay. <laughs> nice and confusing. Now, I got it. When you said you had applied to 10 more film festivals, you didn't sound thrilled about the opportunity to apply to 10 film festivals. Right. Well, it costs money. So every film festival costs anywhere. The lowest was $4. The most expensive was uh, almost $200. Um, really, that is, you know, a crapshoot you have n chances are you're it's just money that's going away you're not going to see any benefit from that uh we've only won one prize that had a monetary prize which um was chagrin and that was fifteen hundred dollars which is a All right you know it's exciting but it's a drop in the bucket when you think about how much all this costs <laughs> Um, well, it sounds like it might cover your film festival entry fees for the next 10 film festivals. That's true. <laughs> Although I, there are people I still need to pay, which I need to, you know, I hate not being able to pay them, but we will pay them. It's just a matter of time. Um, we did have, um, well, anyway, to finish with that question, um, it also, sometimes it's easy to fill out the um, applications because it's like the Common Core app and it's through Film Freeway and all I need to do is click some buttons and put in a cover letter and send it so it's easier. But oftentimes with the Academy Award Qualifying Film Festivals, they want you to completely fill out the application from scratch. And that takes a long time. It's not something that's fast. So... It's a little daunting to think I still have 10 more um, to, to do. So, What about your business manager? Can't you make him do it? <laughs> He's so busy doing everything else. Um, oh, yeah. whatever. He's a busy guy. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Well, hey, uh, so you mentioned Chagrin. Uh, you just got back from that. You, how long were you there? I was there for a little under a week. We got there on Tuesday and we left on Monday. And it was one of the most incredible experiences I have ever had. Uh, I owe the Chagrin Doc Fest, the town of Chagrin Falls, a huge, huge uh, thank you because they were phenomenal, uh, particularly given the pandemic and just the hurdles of putting in an in-person film festival at all. It was fascinating because it was the first real experience I've had with any public screening since before COVID. And the landscape for all of it has changed dramatically. So 
I was surprised that we got so many of our crew there. Janie Miller and her daughter Kirsten were there. They are executive producers. Bill Ebel, our editor, was there. Sam King, who is one of our social media uh, content guys, was there. We also had... um, Who else do we have there? Julie Danis came. She's one of our co-writers. So Rick Arbazani was there. So we had a good group of our crew, but also Bob Devinney, one of our World War II veterans was there. And so there was a huge responsibility for us to all be super careful around Bob. And uh, I kept having to give him hand sanitizer because he refused to wear the masks and he did, he kept wanting to shake everybody's hands. And, um, you know, it's not like he was, he just wasn't mad about it, but he just forgot, you know, it's sort of the way we all feel. Uh, so we were really working hard to protect him. Um, but the town, was just so excited to do this festival because it's such a part of their DNA that they just pulled out all the stops. We stayed in the uh, the inn at Chagrin Falls, which was this beautiful quaint uh, inn, which really felt like I was in a home. And I, the people there, Tom was the owner, Barb, Beth, Suzanne, I now feel like they're family they just treated us as if we belonged there. So it was super cozy and beautiful. The fall in Chagrin, Ohio, the leaves were just stunning. And where we were set up in the park, Chagrin Falls has this adorable little downtown area with restaurants and popcorn stores and ice cream stops. And uh, then it has these beautiful falls and a long river walk that goes along it. And so people were out walking their dogs and they were uh, just really enjoying the beautiful weather. It couldn't have been better. But I would say of the 100% of people that were walking along the river walk and shopping and going to restaurants, maybe 5% stopped to talk to us. And we were set up near the uh, the festival had a big LED screen in the park right next to us with a big grassy area, and they were showing free films. So they showed all the shorts from 12 noon uh, and at 6 p.m. And in between those times, they ran the trailers and interviews with the filmmakers and there were people that would show up for the 12 and six slots and watch the films, bring their dogs, you know, their kids. They really did not want to talk to us. And people kept their distance. A lot of people had their masks on. But when people did choose to talk to us, there were two stark contrasts. One, they would talk to us with their masks far away and be very guarded or They have no masks on and they're talking to us like there is no virus to be concerned about whatsoever. It was, you know, total extremes. And there were, we talked to several veterans who were so excited we were there. We talked to a Chinese journalist who has a Chinese paper who uh, was so excited to meet our World War II veteran and put her story, our story in her paper. So The most exciting thing was we met one other filmmaker there, Tim Kaminsky. He has a film called Classic, which is uh, filmed in Alaska. And it's all about this group of people that decide or they uh, wager on when the ice is going to melt. And he is from Alaska. He filmed this awesome film. And he also worked on The Social Dilemma. So it was super interesting to talk to him and to hear about the social dilemma work and to hear about this new film. And he's going to come on our podcast, I hope, either next week or the next week to talk about sort of his first time endeavor making this documentary. So it was great when we found uh, Tim and his team because it felt like we'd found our people. They were, you know, speaking our same language. They faced all of the challenges we'd faced. And That was very encouraging, and it gave us an idea of what this would festival experience would normally be like if it was a regular year. It, you know, and they so uh, let me interrupt you for a second. You you said he 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 was the only filmmaker you met. Is that because he was the only one that came besides you, or he he was the only one who came? Okay. Yeah. So there were we found out at the end there were six hundred entries for this film festival. One hundred and one films were entered. 
Only 18 films showed in person at the theater. And out of those, I, I, I know that Tim and I were there. I heard one other filmmaker may have been there, but nobody I knew saw them. So, and at the awards ceremony, they announced all the awards. There were nine awards total. I was the only filmmaker that won an award that was there. So I thought about it too, like, yeah, this is so sad because we don't get the normal experience. They say that over 13,000 people just flock to that town every year for that festival. And everyone there was so sad because it wasn't like that. But I thought if it was like that, we may have gotten lost in the in the crowd. And because it wasn't like that, there were a lot of people that were so excited to meet us and see the film. And um, so I was very, I was very thankful for that. So you mentioned the you, there are screen films on this LCD screen at the park, but wasn't your screen at a drive-in? Yeah, so it's an LED screen. And then they had two venues. One was in the park where these free films were. And the other was actually behind the cinemas. And they had three bigger LED screens, a sound system set up. And then they had, you had to turn your radio station in your car to 89.9 to hear the audio. Um, for my film, um, it was during the day, it wasn't even dark. You could see the movie just fine. You could hear it fine. We ended up getting out of our cars and sitting in chairs that we had bought, uh, which was a really nice viewing experience because we could kind of be together. Uh, we had about 40 cars at our screening, um, which I think was the sold out number. Um, it was really cool. I'd never been to a drive-in. So that was a unique experience. We did have problems with some cars not being able to tune in the audio. And that was frustrating because two of them were on our team. But, uh, you know, I guess they're, it, it was more successful than not. All right. And then how did they handle the, so what was the award you got? You got, uh, you, you, I won't guess, you tell me. Yes. Well, I do want to explain one thing. Do you remember that event where I told you I'd made a really big mistake and I couldn't tell you what it was, but I would tell you eventually? So I'm going to tell there's, you. There's, there's, there's too many mistakes to keep track of, Christian. <laughs> That's true. This podcast really <laughs> should be how not to make a documentary. Um, so way back when, I was told by the Chagrin Doc Fest director that I had made it to the finalist category in two awards, the Emerging Filmmaker Award and the Best of Fest Award. And I was told not to say anything. And I was mm. like, of course I won't say anything. I will, mum is the word. And not a week later was I interviewed by HollywoodChicago.com and they asked me to put down all the awards I had won. And so I listed that I was a finalist. I don't know why I did it. I don't know why I didn't did it. I didn't even, it didn't even cross my mind. But when the HollywoodChicago.com article and interview came out, he had put in the tags the finalist awards for that festival. And the festival got a Google alert about it. And they reached out to me and like, we just want to remind you, you're not supposed to say anything about this. And I <laughs> was devastated. I felt horrible. I'm such a rule follower. I don't like not following rules. Plus, I really felt like it jeopardized my team or my chances to win. And then I wrote them and I fell on my sword and I apologized. And uh, then I didn't hear from them for a week. And I was just beside myself with worry. Um, and then they wrote me back and it wasn't a big deal. So uh, it, it wasn't a big deal because they didn't announce um, the finalists at all. They just announced the winners. And the way that it worked was after our film closed, they had the awards ceremony from 7 to 7.30. And your ticket, your $50 ticket, bought you entrance to the awards ceremony and a viewing of My Darling Vivian, which is a film by um, about Johnny Cash's first wife, which actually was a very good film. I enjoyed it a lot. So we were uh, there, and they did the whole award ceremony in a video. 
So it was all done video. Um, we just sat there and watched and listened. And what was really cool, though, was when the video was all over it, they called me out. I got to get out of my car and I got to go receive my little award and uh, my check and my little congratulations award. And I got to wave to everybody and everybody was honking and uh, took a bow. And <laughs> I felt a little bit, you know, famous for one second. Was it was Did it you, like one of those big checks, or was it like a you know just here's a check like? <laughs> I need a little check. I even have it right here. I haven't deposit. Uh, yeah. So this is the envelope they gave me. Okay. It was just a little envelope. So I cracked open the seal. I'm showing you if you're not watching on video. And then it was just a note that said thank you for your film and. Um, but one of the first things that was so exciting, I'm showing you on video, I got a bag, a goodie bag when I got there with filmmaker on it with my name and my film. And I just felt so awesome. Um, and so I got a little bit of a taste of what it would be like at a real year. Um, and it was such an incredible blessing. So a huge shout out to them. I did not win the Best of Fest award uh kushasha i think uh, a film about a south african kids soccer team won the best of fest award uh they had a strong connection with david ponce who was the young filmmaker that died his mother ended up finishing his film and then creating the film festival and the entire family had a connection to this film because it was um, you know, closely tied to their son's film. So I didn't really have a chance, I didn't think. Um, but I get to keep the best of the Fest finalist Laurel, which is kind of cool. So Yeah, very cool. So that was exciting. Why why, why were you there on a Tuesday to a Monday? Did the, did the festival start on Tuesday? Like, yeah. how long did it run? It started on Tuesday. And so what we did was we went to the park which, which what we've always done before, we go to the public space and we talk to people and we hand out our cards and we sell our merchandise. And so we were expecting, you know, because we wanted to help sell tickets for our show. And so we took our postcards that we were supposed to hand out to everybody. And we did talk to a lot of people who did end up coming. So if we hadn't have been there, it probably wouldn't have sold out. Okay. So we didn't really sell a lot of merchandise because nobody wanted to touch anything. <laughs> Stupid <laughs> pandemic. All right. Well, one okay, thing so that, happened that was exciting while I was there, um, I got a phone call Saturday morning from a man that was just crying and said, I just saw your interview on Newsmax. It's amazing what you're doing. I want to donate to your film. And uh, I, I had no idea what was happening because I had forgotten that the interview that I did two weeks ago that was bumped because of the president's health briefing, um, it aired on Saturday morning. And from that, uh, it was a nine minute interview. We're going to put up some clips on our YouTube at some point, but we did get about $250 in donations because of that. So that was great. All right. Oh, very cool. Where was it? I'm sorry, you said Newsmax? Yes, it aired on Newsmax last Saturday. Okay. I'm not familiar with Newsmax. How, how would how do people listen to Newsmax? Great question. I'm not sure. I originally thought that it was going to be <laughs> on One American News and that's who the interview was with, but Newsmax owns One American News. So when I saw the video, it just said Newsmax on it. So at some point, I don't know, we'd have to look it up. Jason, what are you finding? Nothing yet, huh? I'm looking. I'm looking. <laughs> I'm Googling <laughs> furiously. Yeah. Our trusty, dusty researcher needs to fill us in on that. All right. So yeah. chagrin. Win for chagrin. So yes. uh, at the drive-in. Uh, forgot my rhyming scheme I used for that. <laughs> anyway. So congratulations. That's a big deal. Another Laurel. Um, and then what's coming up next? You're... Well, this weekend, I, I wish this podcast would would come out earlier this week, but we just had too much going on. This weekend is super exciting. And by the time people are listening to this, it will be over, but I still want to talk about it anyway. Uh, we're in the La Femme Film Festival, which is a big 
It's one of the top female filmmakers festivals in the world. It's in LA. And I'm stunned that we got in when I saw the, it's a lot of Hollywood films. So I don't really know how we got in, but we did. And they are doing this crazy thing where I can have my own live theater screening. And so what that looks like is I have a theater room. I invite people to my screening. People can come into my screening. I can talk with them, interact. They can be on video, just like in Zoom. And then I show them the film in real time. We all watch together. They can text me questions and I can answer during the film. And then after the film is over, we can do a live interactive Q&A session, just like we could if we were in a theater. And so we're going to have cast and crew there tonight. Um, and then Saturday and Sunday, we've got veterans that are joining us, C.O. Bauer and Charles Shea and French cast members. So that's a big festival that's going on this weekend that ends on Sunday. Then we have a week off. And then Hunter and I are headed to Cedar City, Utah for the Red Rock Film Festival. Our film screens on November fifth and i'm in a panel on november 6th and there's a whole bunch of film events that happen during that time so it's also going to be uh, a virtual one so that will be the last time that i know about that people can watch our film so if they haven't watched yet um this weekend and next weekend are the last two chances to watch the girl who wore freedom before it and how will the, how will they handle red rock like in terms of people watching it? So it'll be the same way. You have to buy a ticket. It's actually the same ticketing group that ran the Boston Film Festival, Eventive. So you buy a ticket and you watch it at home, just like you did for The Girl Who Wore Freedom on in Boston's Film Festival. Speaking of Boston, have you heard from them? Um, I was told... Uh, about three times now that they were going to post the awards tomorrow. Um, I'm checking actually right now on their website. Now, are you saying like tomorrow being the 17th or three times you've been told, told it'll be tomorrow? I, nope, it'll be tomorrow. No, it'll be tomorrow. Yeah, that's what I've heard. No, it will be tomorrow. Okay. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm on their website right now and there's still no announcement. So I don't even know what to say about that. Boston. What are you going to do? I don't know. Nothing. I'm going to just move on. And <laughs> <laughs> Well, I will say Saturday Night Live has another very funny Boston commercial. Uh, you remember the Dunkin' Donut with Casey Affleck one? Yes. <laughs> they kind of have like a sequel to that with uh, Bill Burr. Uh, it's so good. It's so funny. Can I Google it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it you just can came out it. Like on the, on the 10th of October. It's, it's their pumpkin beer. <laughs> it's, it's pretty good. Oh, I don't like that. I don't like that. <laughs> After he drinks the whole thing. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna. Most Boston's it. they're 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 a funny crew. <laughs> Boston people are a funny crew. That is for sure. Yes. Um. Yeah. Uh, so I mean, the only other thing that was interesting, we're still waiting to learn, is that not only did I win fifteen hundred dollars, but I wore a distribution, won a distribution deal. With Gravitas oh, right. Ventures. Wait, with who? Gravitas Ventures. Oh, I know them. Hello. Like they, they, have, they have the napkin logo with like Gravitas Ventures written on it. Exactly. <laughs> okay, can we talk about distribution? Yes, let's talk. All right. So honestly, I, I'm losing track of what we've talked about on the air and off the air. So and what can we <laughs> That actually happened with Phil on the Holy Post, and he said things he wasn't supposed to, and Jason had to edit them out. That that was maybe the most edited Holy Post we've had in a long time. <laughs> there was so much I had to cut out. <laughs> okay, so before Gravitas, you were working on another deal. Can yes. you talk about any updates with that? Yes. Um, <laughs> just thinking about She's thinking. I, yeah. Um, so... We are very close to announcing, uh, uh, you know, more news about that distribution deal. Um, there's still a lot of things we're, uh, you know, 
checking out. We've been trying to hold off to see if we won the distribution contract with Gravitas Ventures. Um, so that's just an interesting situation. Uh, even more interesting is that the man that announced my award, his name was Nick uh, Roy, Royer, I think his name is. You can watch the awards at the Chagrin Doc Fest Facebook page. They've posted the video. I, his, I knew his name looked familiar, and I went back and checked my emails, and he was the one that wrote me and told me that they were going to pass on distribution for our film because it had too much French. Wait, what? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but now they don't have a choice, huh? <laughs> <laughs> right. So, it's just a very interesting situation. I met him in 2017 in Chicago. I pitched him our film. He said, sounds great. Send me the rough cut. I sent him the rough cut in 2019. And he looked at it and passed because he said it was too much French and their audience wouldn't buy it. So I was like, okay, I understand. And you know, now we're in a situation where they have a contract to provide distribution to me if I won that award. And it's Friday and I still haven't heard from them. <laughs> so I don't know if that is the company for us just to, for anything, because I, I wouldn't want a distribution company to distribute my film just because they have to. Now, do they pass because it was French or because it was a foreign language in it? No, foreign language. I mean, half of our film is subtitled. Right. And so... It, that surprises me about Gravitas. I would have thought... Yeah, I, I thought they, they had more of like a, a wide yeah. net. But well, if, you go so to many their, if you go to their website, Gravitas has a huge library and they do have films like that. So it was very confusing to me why that would they would have passed for that reason. Um, but... Again, it was the rough cut. At that point, I think it was two hours long, maybe, or not much shorter than that. It's a very different film now at 90 minutes. Um, but again, you know, we'll have to hear what they have to say. You want a, a relationship with a distributor that really believes in your film and really wants to distribute it. And I do feel that way about this other company um, there's a lot of reasons for them to really market this well, and that will affect our bottom line. So we have to look at, um, you know, at the bottom line for all of these deals, because ultimately documentaries traditionally do not make money. They just don't, particularly a first time out the gate. So it would be a huge win if we broke even, Um so I need to make sure that we are in a deal with people who are going to market and sell our film passionately uh, in order to make our money back. So Hunter and I are working on all of these deals to make sure that that happens. And I'm encouraged. I'm very encouraged. That's good. Um, the next thing that we have to decide is this one company that we're talking about is only wanting North American rights but we do want to sell this film worldwide. So we would have to go with another distributor as well if we did that deal. So complicated. So much hangs in the balance. So much hangs <laughs> in the balance. All right. Uh, so I'm, we just got... looking, I'm just looking at Gravitas Ventures um, library and they actually have Faith Based, who we just had Luke Burnett. Um, really, really? <laughs> yeah, they're they're like the fifth film down on their list right now. We just had Luke Burnett on the Holy Post and um, the movie proposal uh, talking about his film. So, yeah, they definitely have a very wide range of films looking at this. <laughs> Everything from horror to buddy comedies to documentaries. So, yeah. This, this they are, they're kind of more like, aren't they, aren't they more like indie type, like lower budget indie? Yeah, it definitely budget. feels that way. Okay. Right. Yeah, but they are not, they are one of the top U.S. distributors. The complaint about Gravitas that I have heard from other filmmakers or people in the industry is that they do buy up a whole bunch of films. They have a big library. I've heard this also with Lionsgate. And if a company has acquired a whole bunch of things, the question is, where do you fall in their priority list? You know, and 
if if a distribution company has so many films, they're really only going to manage the ones that they want to push and sell hard. And whatever happens with the other ones happens with the other ones, right? So it's usually, you know, you really have to be careful and you want a distribution company that wants you. So. Understood. All right. Well, why don't we, you know, we got Chagrin was a big success. We're waiting on Boston, Red Rock, La Femme. Maybe you take a break. Got to apply 10 more. So we're on this distribution film festival. It doesn't uh, ever stop. No rest for the weary. It feels like a treadmill. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it, it bears repeating. It is a business. It is a business. I am running a business. I'm running a business in the red at the moment. I'm trying to move into the black. And to do that, I have to market and make wise business decisions. And right now, I still really need to raise money. I mean, I, we have $1,000 a month overhead. We have film festival fees coming up. And um, somehow, that money has to come from somewhere. And so... People can buy things in the shop. That helps. People can make donations directly on our website. Um, so uh, if you're a praying person, start praying because we definitely need a few more miracles. All right. Well, anything else we need to promote or remind or discuss before we say goodbye? We are looking for some more interns. We have had some people resign on our uh, staff just because, um, you know, their jobs are picking back up and they don't have as much free time. So we're looking for someone to help. We're looking for someone to help as a webmaster. We're looking for a graphic designer. We are looking for social media people business people, accounting people, uh, and event planners. So we really are, um, we're, we're about to start, we're going to get serious about interviewing people. Um, and we're going to require a six-month commitment, like it's really starting to get real, where, um, you know, if people do well and help us now uh, for my next film, you know, they'll be the first ones hired when there's a budget. The next film. Oh my goodness. I can't even believe you're talking about the next film. I know. We're gonna, we're gonna have to change the name of the podcast to documentary second. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Probably. Documentary, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but thanks, thanks so much, you guys. I just want to, you know, our listeners are and our fans have really helped us get this far. I was in chagrin and I was uh, praying and reading my Bible Saturday morning before it began. And I also happened to look at LinkedIn and there was this video of this little boy and he was in a gym and he had cerebral palsy and he was trying to pick up this big boulder and lift it up and put it on this ledge, this table. And he had this coach there that was just jumping up and down and screaming for him and telling him he could do it. And he got it right to the edge and, and he really couldn't do it. And the coach just urged him on and he made it. And I just wept when I saw that. But my focus was not so much on the little boy, but it was on the coach, the coach who probably was the one that encouraged him to pick up the boulder, who inspired him to do it, who kept telling him he could. And despite all of his disabilities, and it was such a powerful visual for me. And in light of the context that I was in that morning, it made me think about all of the people that have supported us, who have donated money, who have cheered us from the sides, you guys included. You know, I was that little boy trying to pick up a boulder and I've had so many people surround me, whether it's my family, every time I wanted to quit or, um, people in my, you know, small group. It's just, I could have never done it without those people telling me that I could and encouraging me along the way. So I just want to say thank you to you two and to all the people listening that have helped and encouraged us and uh, don't stop. We still need, we still need to keep going. So more to do. That's awesome. Well, hey everyone, thanks for being a part of this. I know a Christian is grateful and so are we. 
And we will close by saying thanks for listening to Documentary First, where we believe everyone has a story to tell and you can be the one to tell it. Yes, you can. Bye, everybody.